Welcome to the show, Johnny. Welcome. Welcome. Let's start that again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcoming you to your own show there. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's great to have you. And you're definitely going down the, the podcast rabbit hole now in terms of you and Fergus building up Pomnia performance as well. We are, mate. We are. So it's, it's less alien to me now to be sat with a microphone between the two of us than it might have been six months ago or something. We're just starting to get used to the process. Yeah, you're getting into it. And, and when Fergus introduced us, he said you're a man that's led very many lives. Yeah, yeah, we joke about that. We joke about the, the many lives of, of Johnny Payne. We can probably cover some of that off if you like, but it's uh, it's such a, a varied uh, background that I have that to try and do it in chronological order, I'd get it wrong. So I'd probably just, we'll, we'll pick at things, shall we? A little piece of sounds good. Well, <laughs> let's go back to that first one, growing up in Thurso. What was that like? Thurso, it's one of those things, you know, when you look back on it, Thurzo, I love Thurzo. I still do. Because uh, we had lots of things there that, that you, you don't get other places. We had freedom, huge amount of freedom. Yeah. Um, but I think when I grew up there, I think it was less now, there was only about 10,000 people there at the time. Dunray, the, the nuclear site up there, was uh, probably the main employer. Uh, and, there, and there was a, a, a company called Norfrost who made, I think they, they literally white labeled all the freezers and things that you would buy. And they had their own, they were huge, huge. So those are the two companies that really employed everybody. Norfrost is gone and Dunray is being decommissioned. So it's a very different town up there. But nice, nice. I mean, it's beautiful. The surroundings were good. We had a little time between I was eight and 12 where we came down and lived in Helensborough, uh, obviously close to here. Uh, so I had a bit of a dip in that kind of uh, more urban kind of life and then back up to Thurzo. But we had surfing on the doorstep. Surf, uh, Thurzo, I don't know if you know, there's a surfing mecca. There's people from all over the world coming to th- just to surf up there. So we had that kind of subculture of surfing and subculture of skateboarding. And I was a keen skateboarder, not, not a keen surfer, but a keen skateboarder. And, the, and, and that was kind of prevalent throughout that whole thing. So, and music, you know, because we're so far away from everything, music became uh, a huge part of our lives because you'd have to, you know, I'm kind of giving away my age here a little bit. We, we'd have to send off, if we wanted an album, we'd have to send off for that album, maybe wait about six weeks for it to come back. Okay. So when it came back, it was precious. We had a good friend of ours, uh, Tommy, God bless him, he's, he's gone now. He had uh, cancer and, and so well, he had leukemia. So what he would do is he'd go down into Glasgow and spend time here in the, uh, in the hospital. And then as he came out, he would get to visit loads of music shops and, and he brought back and he could bring it back, and music of course. and things. So, so we'd all be around Tommy's kind of get into the music. So, so I've, got, I've got really fond memories of it, but it's small. There's not a lot happening and we got to a certain age, as did most kind of kids. For me, 14, 15, I need out, I need to see more, went to Glasgow. Yeah, what was pointing you towards what you do now? Was there anything hinting at it back then? No, uh, not, not really, no. No, it's, again, these these many lives of Johnny Payne is, is, is probably sport. You know, I enjoyed sport, uh, but I enjoyed singular sports. I wasn't a very good team player, um, mostly because I kind of hated the notion of relying on other people for, for what I wanted to achieve. Although I don't think going back that far, I had any knowledge of ambition or achievement, but I was really competitive. Even with the skateboarding, I was determined to be the best you know, and, and fed up, like well, obsessively fed up if I wasn't. So, um, so there's that, there's that kind of need to compete has, has always been there. More so than I would have even been aware. I was told that later in life. You'd be always been so competitive. It's a pain in the arse. And, oh, didn't, didn't realize. <laughs> but no, that kind of came... Further, there, there, there's kind of a tie as we go through time that kind of leads to relatively sensibly, if you, if you like, or relatively um, intuitively. But back then, there would have been no inclination to be... It was hinting towards nah, your interest in coaching and no, fitness to the level. None whatsoever. None yeah. Apart from maybe uh, an inclination to, to throw my hands about and fight a little bit, which which kind of led me to that point, which, you know, so there is a tie in there. But no, I never, I never thought as a kid, I want to be a strength and conditioning coach. Couldn't have told you what one was, to be honest. What took you to Glasgow then? Music? Music, yeah. It was an out, really. Uh, uh, again, so, so life number two, I suppose, was um, I came to Glasgow and went to Annie's Land College. Um, I don't know if Annie's Land College even still exists. It might be something else. Yeah, I th- it might have rebranded, but I, I, the, the college building itself is still there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was, uh, and am a qualified looter uh, in the sense that, that uh, I, I was, my... Uh, Studies were stringed instrument repair and technology. So I was making violins, guitars, and repairing them. Uh, but that, for me, felt like a musical way to get out of Thurzo. But really, it was a carpentry course. You know? <laughs> so when I got there, I wasn't playing music. I wasn't doing music. I was just learning how to build them, which 
there's a creative process, but there's a very strict process. I wasn't very good at it. Actually, I was reasonably good at it, but I didn't like it. I felt it was too stunting. There was too it was too particular. I needed to. Whereas your interest in music was more from the what was created off the back I of it. To, yeah, yeah, you know, I was still 15, 16 year old when I did that, uh, and I just wanted to be a rock star. You know, like like every kid at fifteen, sixteen. You know, so so that's why I was in Glasgow because I saw opportunity here to kind of be in bands and all that kind of stuff, which I did. Um, but the, the course itself didn't really lend it. Although I met people there that were really into the music scene. So it, it had its benefits, but I, I turned up 20% of the time. <laughs> I still scraped through, luckily, but uh, I haven't used it since. Yeah, so. it was a means to an end to leave where you were from to do a sort of semi-related thing to the industry in which you had yeah. a passion for. To a degree. I mean, it, yeah, my folks weren't going to let me go to Glasgow from Thurzo, unless I had something specific that I was doing, unless you get into a course, you get part of that course, you get yourself set up. Uh, my granddad was out in Moody'sburn um, at the time, so there was a kind of a local touching point where I could be looked at. I was only a boy, really. Um, but I think even then I knew I wasn't interested in that course. It was just like a box ticking exercise for me. So when I got down here, I wasn't paying much attention to it. What was the music scene like in Glasgow then? Great, mate. It still is. It's still a great scene. Um, it was probably just, let me think timelines wise. I think I arrived here just as the kind of Britpop thing was kicking off and becoming a thing, just as indie music became something that was accessible in that sense, that where, where music met uh, style, met kind of fashion and, and, and all that kind of stuff was where we were really interested in it. We sort of um, Stone Roses and the Mondays and all the rest of it. We had that kind of, guitar band crossover into dance into music into style into that little subculture that's what that was happening at the time so we were just i say we uh i was here kind of w with a girl that i was with at the time and most of my friends were still up north tommy would come down now and again but uh introductions to people happen really easy yeah well if you're in a course like that and obviously if you're out in that scene then you would meet other people that were regularly going to the same gigs and the same events exactly, as you. you you grow a network it's like, like that. anything it's like anything every every kind of scene that you're into is only a little sort of a microcosm isn't it? it's a small it's a small world once you find yourself in it. it looks big from the outside but as you say this person knows that person and you know you get a gig or you, or you play here you do this or do that and uh, yeah it's good it's good but yeah. i spent more time drinking and doing other things than I did playing music. I was just, now I was just immersed in seeing bands and all the rest of it. Whereas that, the idea had been to be in a band and that did happen. Uh, but I was what too, kind of music? too drunk to pursue it. <laughs> uh, guitar based uh, indie music, really, really. So I, I played lots of instruments, but at that time I was playing drums most of the time. So I was, I was a drummer, uh, could play the guitar arguably better than I could play drums at the time. But, um, People wanted drummers. I was, I would just do anything. That was where the vacancy was. That, exactly that. Yeah, yeah. Plus, it was easier. You could just get in and crack the drums, and not e easier. Easier in my mind, harder to make a mistake with the drums than it was the guitar. How so long did you lazy. spend in Glasgow then? Oh, three years. And what drew you away? Uh, so music, uh, and then uh, my own stupidity broke that a little bit. So I was going to be in a band. Um, with a guy who had been, who had grown up with in Thurzo, uh, we were going to be in a band together and they were all set up in Bristol. Uh, so the idea was that I was going to kind of, we chatted on the phone, do you want to come to Bristol? Let's make a thing of it. Let's really make this happen. And, uh, in, in typical fashion at the time, I think I remember being in a phone box, making a call to this fella, really just about arrangements. I'll be down and it ended up, I don't know how, I still don't know how we're friends again, but it ended up in a big argument on the phone. All my differences stuff. in creative vision or something, something like that, Johnny. Perhaps I was just probably rude to him, and he just wasn't having it. Something like this. Two, two, two hard-headed Scotsmen, you know, young guys, too fiery. Uh, don't talk to me that way. You know, can I swear on this? Is this of course you can, like, Johnny. Fuck you, mate. And he's like, fuck you back, and it kind of went back and forth like that. And uh, so all my stuff uh, was packed in a big transit van. But now I don't don't show up in Bristol, or, <laughs> or we're going to go at it. So I'm like, oh shit, where do we go? Um, cause we'd left, we'd, we'd, uh, we were out, no, no, nowhere to live, all that kind of stuff. Everything was in the van. We were going, going to live in Bristol. Uh, and the girl that I was with at the time, her mum was in Nottingham. So she said, well, why don't we, why don't we go there? There's space for us there. We'll go to Nottingham. We'll get ourselves kind of squared off there. And then maybe you can kind of repatch things. And from there we can, so it was kind of, this was our stopgap. 
Uh, the Midlands in between Glasgow and Bristol. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it kind of Literally, is on the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I don't know anything about Nottingham. Never been there. Uh, no, nothing. Uh, no connection to it, barring uh, barring this this girl Vicky, her, her mum, and uh, she she took us in, looked after us, loved us, uh, and I stayed in Nottingham. We didn't stay together, but I stayed in Nottingham for the best part of, I want to say, eighteen years. So we ne- I never got any further, <laughs> and Nottingham was a, was a whole different story. So so that's that's where maybe stage three started for me. Yeah. How did it differ to Glasgow then in terms of did it still have the lively music scene? Could you pursue that there? Not so much. No, I, I kind of left that behind to to a certain degree. Once we got there, uh, I needed to find a job. I needed to do things. I needed to make some money. Um, An element of reality, almost. Yeah, I think so. I, I think so because we were no longer kind of in this group of people either i needed to kind of fend for myself more so than before and it was maybe i was just growing up as well it's a case of right i need to kind of look after myself here and, and do things but i was just doing odd jobs i, uh, I remember signing to an agency and uh, within a week i had been a bin man i'd worked in the wood mill i'd done all kinds of different things you know and that's what i did for years was just job to job to job just to kind of make money come in nursing homes bits and bobs just just doing a lot there uh, and again still still drinking hard uh, and then at that point, kind of start throwing my hands about a bit as well. So yeah, what led to you starting fighting? Uh, being Scottish uh, to a degree, and I, I know that seems like a like like a weird thing to say, but when I got down there, Nottingham's a hard city, you know, and it's it's a good it's a working. I have a lot of love for Nottingham. So it's a working class city, but I remember the pub. And some of this was my attitude as well. But I remember going into a pub uh, and sitting having a pint, maybe chatting to somebody. They picked up in the Scottish accent, and there was this kind of weird jump which does happen like oh you think you're hard do you I'm like what because i'm scottish <laughs> no not really uh mon let's go or in in their accent and, and it was a case of i just had a, had a a bit of a brawl with a guy strangely gentlemanly set up let's go outside into the car park stand there coats off and let's go there was somebody almost managing no kicks on the ground and stuff on the cobbles he used to call that uh so we went out on the cobbles i won quite fast and quite convincingly and uh and that started that meant like two three days later there was a different lad from a different village was going to come down and see who this kid was and have another go and a reputation you beat my mate let's go all this kind of stuff and you know i wasn't interested in that at all uh, i just wanted to have a pint <laughs> just relax a little bit uh always up for a party always up for a laugh and and slowly that became something that was happening a lot um uh, yeah, and a reputation. Like bare knuckle stuff just outside the pub. Yeah, we wouldn't even have called it that. It was just, let's go, you know, let's have a scrap. And and uh, yeah, that was happening once every couple of nights, I would think. Um, and then less so. Th- then I remember going to things, being invited to, to things like where you would go, a, a guy I was drinking with casually, didn't really know much about him. I remember we, I went to to watch some fights at, uh, I'd always liked boxing. Uh, uh, my granddad was a boxer, my mum mom loved boxing. So boxing's always been a part of our lives. But um, I remember going to watch some fights, but it was in a, a gypsy encampment and, and we were we were there. Um, like Snatch, it was like hay bales everywhere. Before, this is way before Snatch was a film. But yeah. Hay bales everywhere. But this was what it was maybe based on. Oh yeah, I mean, there's some there's some <laughs> The dogs. There. Exactly, yeah, the dogs. Uh, and, uh, and the guy that I had been drinking with two hours earlier, just a little guy. He 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 came rushing in and and uh, convincingly beat a monster, you know. And I remember thinking, how the hell has he done that? Look at this face of this. This guy was five foot four and maybe sixty kilos. The dude he was fighting was a, you know, a monster, like a, like a cartoon character, like sixteen feet tall and just as many feet wide, you know. Johnny Bravo sort of division. Yeah, yeah. and then J- Jimmy laid waste to him. Uh, and afterwards, I saw him later on in the pub saying, "How did you? How did you do that?" And he took me under his wing. Turned out he'd spent the best part of thirty years in Okinawa, <laughs> doing some crazy stuff, and and still still one of the hardest men I've ever met. But he switched me on a little bit to being more disciplined uh, and to trying to learn a little bit more. So at this point we we got fights. You know we were looking to fight these guys, and it's all so MMA at that point wasn't a thing. Um, it was probably years before even the videos that you could get of of the early UFCs came out. You know. So we hadn't even seen this kind of stuff, but we were able to do the little unlicensed bouts downstairs in the in, in the back rooms of pubs and things, and uh, which is just where that stuff happened. I mean, it wasn't, I guess it was illegal, but it wasn't really because it, it was just because where else were you going to do it? You know, we, it wasn't going to happen in a arena. And that's where you would have like 
eyes that were interested in seeing that sort of thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I had just enjoyed it. You know, I wasn't, the running joke is, and this is where the, the coaching comes in, actually. The running joke was that I was just game, you know, I was just a young game lad, uh, no real skills, just, just willing to go some. And then if you can track back the timeline with the same evolution of MMA timeline, which was, it was called no holds barred at that point, And you had to kind of travel about to find it. Uh, and, and then eventually it became MMA and then it became, you know, you know, what it is now. And what we were finding was the more over the course of maybe three, four years, what, well, initially the guy you were fighting was just another guy who was game. Now you were fighting a guy who was bringing some kind of weird skills. I remember getting caught in a, I think it was an Americana or, or a Kamura, one of the two. And this guy was doing something to my arm that nobody had ever done before. You know, it was, uh, and I, I didn't know to tap. He so was I got trained my or coached in something he else. Was, it was just jujitsu, you know, yeah. and he was good at it. And, and he caught me, uh, uh, he wouldn't have done well standing up with me, but he did something to me and, and I didn't know what to do. So I was, and, and str not arrogantly, but just because I didn't know any better, I just kind of was fighting it. It was getting sore and sore. And um, uh, I think I won that fight. I came away from it, unable to move my arm for months and months and needed surgery. He'd torn my arm pretty much off at the bloody mm. shoulder, you know, but again, I was in the so, back room of a pub. Yeah. And I was so far removed from any skill or knowledge or understanding of what I'd just been through that, that it was kind of a case of shit. These guys are doing things we don't understand. And, and then we went, Jimmy, Jimmy actually knew what that was. He was, like, oh, he was just talking about groundwork. Let's do some of that. Then like, Christ. Okay. So then started joining jujitsu clubs and, um, uh, uh, and other things. And, um, realized that maybe I'd kind of missed the opportunity because, uh, uh, or, or I was more, what was happening was people were asking me, I was strong and I was conditioned and I could go some, and I was only little, you know, 65 kilos, give or take, uh, but, but really capable strength wise. Um, and, and I'd always had a keen interest in strength training. So I'd, I, I like lifting weights and like, but I kind of read a lot about it and understood it, understood nutrition as well, but from a kind of a hobbyist perspective. Yeah. You know, you fight somebody who feels strong. Your first question is, bloody hell, what did you do to get so strong? So I was getting asked that all the time, especially for my weight. Uh, and then advising people and helping people and people that I knew. And, and slowly I was like, I really enjoy this. I like the, the, the imparting of information and, and the facilitating somebody else. And like I say, then the running joke kind of became, um, you know, I wasn't good enough to do it. <laughs> I wasn't good enough to fight, but I was good enough to teach people how to do this. Well, the joke isn't it? those who can't teach, but... Yeah. But it's often a case of maybe you've come to the end of your shelf life in that particular space. I think space. so. I mean, I, I don't think now, perhaps if, if you, if you um, think of the, I've got a lot more patience just as I've grown and just as I've matured and things at the time, if I'd had to be in a, a in a disciplined environment, as in today you're doing jujitsu, you're going to, then later on, you're going to be doing a bit of striking like, like people train now really intelligently. I probably wouldn't have done it. Uh, I, I was a, too arrogant to, to realize and, and a little bit uh, ignorant in a sense to realize that these things were necessary to get better. Uh, nah, nah, I'm game. I'll just do it. I don't need all that shit. You know, let's have a pint. It was so underdeveloped at that point as well. There probably wasn't a framework for you to look at and be like, Oh, well, if I am disciplined, then I can get to no, there this. Wasn't. It's a case yeah. of, look, I can get these fights lined up. That's great. I can go and fight at this pub against this guy who is good at this Yeah, and I'll need to work on my ground work in advance. But it was very much yeah, hate him, scared him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that stuff was there. I mean, laterally, I found as I got more and more interested in, in the uh, strength work and, and kind of applying myself in that field, uh, I realized that there were clubs there. There, there was a, an MMA club, and I think it was called an MMA club, or, or Dan Hardy, you maybe remember Dan Hardy from the UFC, still big on the scene. Uh, he was training out of a club there. He was fresh, new, upcoming, uh, a few fights, and he was training there. So there was these things there but and i wasn't aware of them until maybe a little bit after and then also by that point i'm like you know i'm actually enjoying what i'm doing here i also had a, a real keen this this speaks to maybe a discipline thing or maybe doesn't i, I was involved in 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 a way with um how, how should we say this for, for uh any any of my family listening <laughs> nefarious activities so i was you can imagine the kind of people i was dealing with down there so a lot of my friends were kind of involved in this over overstates it a little bit, but I guess underworld activities. So we were, we were doing things we shouldn't have been doing uh, in order to get by. Um, and, uh, in amongst that w w was a lot of violent threat all the time. So whilst there was a kind of a, uh, uh, recreational factor to training in these, or to, to having these fights and things, 
I was also acutely aware I needed to defend myself. I needed to be As ready. a necessity. Yeah. And also I had built up a certain reputation as well, which arguably I didn't deserve. You know, I'd gotten away with it, I think. You know, so I then started seeking out um, uh, instruction in, I guess, what you would call street fighting. So, so I looked into, um, eventually it sort of landed upon Jeff Thompson and, and Tony Summers went across to Coventry and these guys were very much involved in, in what we call self-protection. Uh, so this is how this kind of stuff manifests in real life. is very different to a rule set and to a referee being there and a kind of a... In a cage. A, a, yeah, a more gentlemanly exchange, right? Let's go. Uh, even training-wise, when you're sparring, you're sparring. But if somebody's actually trying to kill you, it's very, very different. Violence is a very different thing uh, to organized sport, whether it's combat sports or not. So I was more interested for, for a reasons of survival but also I, I i was very interested in just from the from the psychological factor from the fact that it's very different it's very immediate very visceral um that's the kind of route i went down as far as fighting was concerned so i spent a good 15 20 years and still train with that kind of stuff in mind uh, and was there therefore less interested in mma as a whole as a sport and more interested in what what works what's what's lethal what's the what's practicalities real. of it interested you yeah yeah, uh, and that's where I kind of started to really develop the strength and conditioning stuff as well. Being ready for that kind of stuff felt to me more about overall conditioning and overall capability than simply being a, a good fighter. I, I know that anybody listening to this from a from a combat sports background or from a uh, f from a, a martial arts background, there were, there's so many crossovers and so many conversations. People would be keen to interject. Well, ah, you're wrong. You're wrong. but that was my experience at the time. Yeah, and that's all that you can comment on, really. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I have, uh, I, I'm now, uh, it still says on my, on my bio that I'm a, a self-protection instructor. I'm, I'm still involved with the Reality Combat Association, which is part of the World Combat Association under the tutelage of Jeff and, and these guys. And I, th I think, I hope I'm not wrong in, in saying this still. I think I'm still Scotland's only uh, uh, certified self-protection instructor under Jeff's uh, 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 mentorship, if you like. That's, that's so niche that, that really, I mean, we would use that to teach maybe police uh, how, to, how, to, how to work preemption into their game or, or, or to use, or, you know. It's a, yeah, almost a, in the military as well, use, Useful military application um, uh, and, and for people who really feel like they're dormant, et cetera. Uh, and also there's a huge legal component to it. What can I do? What can't I do? That uh, not, not a lot of people dip into enough to know okay these are it's, it's your right to to strike if you are in a, 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 you know mortal fear or danger you know teaching them when that's right and and ultimately the, the peaceful side of that is learning and helping people understand what their options are uh, and that violence is the last option you know generally i've got four kids and i have three of them boys the eldest one is just getting to that point where there, there's fights go on at school and all the rest of it and i keep trying to teach him there's always a way out you can always unless you're backed up against the wall and, and, and it looks tough you can probably just walk away you know so all that kind of stuff is, is part and parcel yeah it's interesting that that was maybe your first experience of coaching though so starting to do these things people may be noticing that johnny's really strong i wonder how he gets that strong johnny's really good at this or johnny's got a reputation for being able to handle himself in this particular environment how do i do that so people coming to you and i think that's one of the things that some of the guests that I've spoken to when it's come to like identifying what their career, or their business should be is what are the things that people are asking you to share in your expertise with? Cause some of these things might be second nature to you by a particular point, probably like your interest in reading about training and nutrition is yeah. probably second nature. But when somebody was like, Oh, like, how does that work? And you're like, well, it works like this. Of course it does. Because I've, I've been reading that for the past three years. And what seems obvious to you is often not obvious to anyone else and anyone who has any interest in fitness at all who's spoken to a member of the general population in an, in an office or environment when they ask you a question about food knows that immediately but you must have started to realize that quite quickly when maybe people were asking you questions around some of the stuff that you were doing at yeah. these fights yeah so the questions were were really basic you know uh nobody really asked about nutrition that was an interesting one that kind of i ended up as an adjunct really to the questions they were asking say well Okay, so, so somebody might say, if we were fighting or we ended up in some kind of clinch or something, they would say, oh, you're, you're strong. Or we would go some inspiring or whatever, uh, and, and I would be conditioned and powerful and things and wouldn't look it particularly, you know. So, uh, so have you been, you know, how did you, it's one of those, isn't it? It sounds egotistical to say it, which is why I'm stumbling a little bit, but how did you get so strong? It's not like I was moving 
300 kilos over my head or anything like that. It was just that in comparison, they could feel that strength. So I'd be able to answer how I got strong, um, which would have been, you know, training and lifting things and moving, you know, and, and following a certain regime and having read this and read that and fo- the rabbit hole that I'd gone down. But what was interesting to me was that if you're asking me how I got strong, I was kind of instantly aware that that might not be useful for you. So then I had homework to do. So if you came to me and say, Johnny, how do I get strong? I say, well, this is how I did it, but I need to know more about how you're moving. I need to know more about how you lift, what you do. I've watched you fight, so I know what you're kind of... So I, I was quite analytical about how I was seeing this kind of stuff panning out, and I didn't want to just say, just do this. Because really I could have just pointed somebody to, I don't know, Muscle and Fitness magazine, which existed yep. then, or, or, or something like that. I just, just follow a routine. Because for the most part, are you doing any strength and conditioning? The answer is no. I and mean, we'll just, just do some curls. Yeah. <laughs> Come back and see me in six months' time once you've started, yeah. But I was aware that the answers were, were bigger than the questions and, and that the people even asking those questions weren't aware of that. So there was something that could be applied there. I didn't have any business interest in that uh, at all. Uh, it wasn't like I was thinking at any point, oh, I can make a living out of this. It was just like, okay, let me think. It's often how it starts though, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed the questions that I was being asked. I enjoyed the puzzle, if you like, or, or, or the conundrum that I was being presented. Uh, and I enjoyed finding the answers. And what I really, really enjoyed was then having the opportunity to apply that with that individual and quickly see the results, but not just see the results like we were saying a minute ago that you would get kind of from, well, there's, there's an old quote, I think, from, from Dan John who says, if you want somebody to be better at bench press uh, and they're not training, they could just ride a bike and they're going to, you could, six months' time, you could come back having ridden a bike for six months and their bench press is going to be better because systemically they've just made themselves more Physically robust. improved, yeah. yeah. Yeah, something overall their conditioning has improved, so the likelihood is they'll just be able to move more. So that could have been the application. I could have just thrown any shit at them, and uh, but I didn't want to. Uh, and <clears throat> over that time frame, which is probably about ten years, I was just getting more and more interested in in, in the question and what the answer was. And that's kind of led me, that led me eventually, w- w- with a gap in the middle, probably with the bits we haven't discussed. But that led me eventually to say, this is actually what I want to do, do as opposed to it being kind of a, a, an outside thing that I was paying a lot of attention to. It was like, no, this, this. These things grow in the background sometimes because yeah. I know in the forefront was you were working in forensic mental health. First That's of all, right. for the listeners. Well, you've done your homework, yeah. Yes. We have, have I mentioned that before somewhere? Fergus and I have similarities in that regard, don't okay. we? We like to do deep dive into our guests. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, for the listeners, what is forensic mental health for starters? Because it's a term so, that's not particularly common, I would say. No, that's that's right. And it sounds probably uh, more impressive than it is. Not to belittle the the, uh, the um, system, but, but forensic just means, you know, uh, from uh, coming through the criminal system. So anybody in the mental health, uh, um, we're not, we, we can't call them institutes anymore. That's what we used to call them, but not. So anybody in, in, that, in that sphere, uh, any patients or clients, I can't remember, let's just call them patients, that's what they were to us at the time, uh, would have come to the service that we were running or that I was part of uh, through the criminal service. So these people who ultimately the people at the sharp end that I was looking after had been through the system and had, had committed some really quite horrible crimes, but had then been deemed to be too ill or, or, or to have some kind of condition which kind of spoke to that as not being uh, a kind of a, a straightforward decision, you know, either or uh, they were so ill after, you know, people that were extraordinarily ill that had been through that system. And usually, almost always, they'd, they'd done something pretty barbaric to get there. So my role was kind of, and this this actually spoke to the strength and conditioning and the, and the fighting to a degree, and, and the, certainly the self-protection stuff. Uh, my role was um, essentially I, I would manage those particular patients who were on high OBS, which were called high observations, those ones that had been, uh, you know, that they were having some kind of episode of their illness worsening or however that might manifest. Uh, and we were kind of positioned almost as security outside the door. And obviously we had to have a kind of a, a, an understanding of their, their conditions and, and uh, we had to be trained in that side of things. But ultimately, if they were going to do something violent that could harm themselves or to harm others, my job was to physically intervene with them. And, and that went on for, I did that job for six or seven years, I think. How did you stumble into that? Was it one of the agency jobs you ended up doing? You mentioned yeah. Binman and you just found this one. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I had been, been 
working in nursing homes, uh, doing relatively menial jobs, but care work as well. Uh, and uh, this had been an opportunity that presented itself through an agency, as you say, where I was able to interview and say, you know, there's a reasonable amount of empathy, there's a reasonable amount of care. I understand these people aren't aren't well. Uh, uh, and and also I, I can present you with a physical solution here as well, which is what, what they needed. They, they're not able to advertise on that front either, but I understood what the role was. So I would do that. So I, I worked for an agency I don't believe exists anymore called Nursing Insecure Environments. Uh, and I was one of those, eventually became one of those individuals that would be sent to where the potential trouble was. That was a, that was a strange life. Yeah, that, that, life, that life, life maybe life four. I don't know where we are in that now. <laughs> uh, that was running running in in uh, uh, conjunction with this kind of nefarious activities as well. So, so everything that I was doing had this kind of theme of um, immediate or, or, or the potential of immediate and sudden violence. Uh, so it was a kind of a very intense world that I was living in. Did you point. become quite good at dealing with that level of threat? Because some people would get yeah. very anxious, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did. I, I became, I, I don't think I ever became, luckily, I don't think I ever became kind of uh, detuned from it or, or, or kind of um, complacent with it. Determined my head's numb. Yeah. Now, there was a certain, there was a point at which I had to move away from it because I had seen too many people die. Uh, it was it was difficult because they, these, these guys and girls would um, often take their own lives as a means to escape the torture that they, they were experiencing. And, you know, my job was to try and find that moment before it happened and stop them. That was one of the kind of things that we had to do. And, you know, often you don't. These these places are set up in order that uh, you, you can reduce and mitigate that risk as much as possible. And that was part of that risk reduction. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work. So we saw some pretty horrible things mm -hmm. and, and had to deal with some horrible things. And I, I think that I never became numb to it, but I became aware that it was a constant and that that being a constant in somebody's life is eventually going to be not good. It's that like a, yeah. it, I kind of saw that there would eventually be a, 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 a sticky, a sticky moment with that. People were becoming ill. So, so the, the, the staff that was working alongside uh, had to receive regular counseling and, and, you know, the support for what we were doing had to be really robust and people would fall by the wayside and need to, it was trauma. They were, they were having their own episodes of trauma. I luckily never found myself in a scenario where I felt like I had been traumatized, but I felt like it quite possibly around the corner. Or as you say, the fact that some of the things didn't seem to traumatize me was a concern as well. And I think, okay, it's a question I, mark in the head, isn't it? Like how, yeah. um, like what do I need to see to be shocked now? This is, you know, cause some of the things were pretty horrific. Well, nowadays the media talk about how video games and violence on films and stuff like that desensitizes kids to yeah. acts of extreme violence. Yeah. But to see it in reality, yeah, that might shift the needle in your head in terms of what might actually be needed to provoke a, a reaction when that necessarily shouldn't be the case. It, it, it primes you for working in that environment and, and delivering and supporting the, the, the patients. But there also comes a point where you check out from that and you need to still be able to be like, okay, well, that did register with me. No, you've hit, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, and the other thing, not to put too fine a point on it, but the other thing was that I was seeing some pretty horrific things in, in real life as well. Um, you know, like I say, I was involved pretty deep in some pretty shady things. So you would see stuff and understand stuff and lose friends and, and, uh, and, you know, be on the front line, if you like, of that at the same time. So, so as I say, my, my whole life for, for a good six years or so, uh, became oriented around violence, uh, in one way or another. And, and I was supposed to be ready to react to it all the time. And I know that that did spill over into into real life in a, in a very negative sense because there was I, I wouldn't be able to go for a drink without kind of looking over my shoulder and 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 also when it wasn't there, you know, people that that weren't involved in any of that. If I was talking to them about things, you know, like I don't know, seeing family for the first time in ages, I would be trying to warn them of impending danger. Listen, you know, let's not go to this pub. If we're going to go here. I want us to sit on this wall. I want us to behave in this manner and all the rest of it. And actually that isn't real life. That was my high red alert was, was enough. And frankly, it was pissing people off. You know, Elements of paranoia and elements of just trying to protect and yeah, which is, yeah. which is maybe you, but like, I saw it everywhere. I absolutely yeah. saw it everywhere. Yeah. And I think I was, you know, like in too spiritual, but I was manifesting it as well. You know, I'm, I, you can find trouble if you look for it. 
you know, and I was the self-fulfilling for prophecy. Exactly that, yeah. yeah. So, so everything that I was doing became immersed in that, and uh, it's just not a comfortable way to live. So, I needed a, an escape route. Was the escape route the coaching, or how did you move forward? It, no, actually, the escape route was was fatherhood. So I, I had, and, it, and that wasn't planned. So I didn't, I didn't set that escape route up. I just took it when it came. <laughs> so, so my uh, now wife uh, Ashley had moved down from from here. She's from Glasgow. She moved from here uh, to be with me in Nottingham. We hadn't been together all that long, uh, but she fell pregnant with uh, our eldest Poppy. Uh, and as soon as that was something that. I was consciously aware of was now going to be a thing in my life. The, the, the only thing I could see that was fundamentally necessary was to move uh, and remove myself from that environment altogether, uh, uh, wholesale. Uh, and we did that. Poppy had only been born three months before we came back up the road. Um, with the with the blessing, if you like, of some of the, the kingpins, if you like, in, in the life that I was part of down there. Uh, and also, at this point, not having done it long, but at this point I'd moved away from that frontline stuff into actually recruiting others. So I was in recruitment at this point and I was, uh, you know, working. I've heard you speak about this and you'd become extremely successful. You'd worked your way up to director level in that space. I had, so yeah, it was very quickly, yeah. almost too quickly. Uh, I think retrospectively I had, I had started in, in recruitment. So three years perhaps before we left to come back up to Scotland, uh, and done well, uh, you know, like anybody else started in the tea room, it wasn't something I had any experience in before. So it was a case of, listen, I'm into this. This was my route out of that frontline stuff from a corporate perspective or professional perspective. Uh, and it was one of those kind of things. I'm relatively intelligent, relatively articulate. So, you know, your branch manager would say, well, you don't need to be stuck in the, the photocopier, mate. We could probably give you something better to do. And within... A very short space of time, you know, regionally, I was picked up to do X amount of work, and and then I got a job uh, as a as a business development manager. Um, the same thing as sales, isn't it? You're just selling the idea of your recruitment practice to to bigger parties. That then moved into stop being about nursing in secure environments for me. I started to uh, recruit foster carers uh, and carers, social workers rather, uh, into packages of care for children who'd been through difficult times you know so, so the foster care packages were, were very very difficult cases um then i got involved in uh, as a procurement lead for these companies so i worked backwards and forwards with government officials who had these larger packages and then i was involved in writing the contracts and the tenders for that so this thing kind of mushroomed real real quick until i was the business development director of a group of companies and that all happened within about three years so by the time we moved north with a new baby in tow, some of this violence still going on, this strange new corporate life where I was kicking about in a suit every day and all this kind of stuff, which hadn't been part of my life at all. Uh, I, I, I found myself um, in, a, in a very strange world, which I didn't really like at all. Um, and fatherhood was the route out? Fatherhood was definitely the route out, yeah. Uh, well, fatherhood wasn't the route out of that scenario, out of the corporate uh, uh, situation. Uh, fatherhood was was the the what should we say, the trigger for me saying I need to, I need to relocate altogether. I need to start fresh. I need to see myself as being uh, a father, uh, see myself as being involved in this corporate growth, a, 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 a breadwinner, somebody who's going to take care of people, but not involved in any of these extra things. I need to kind of focus and just be a grown up. Um, and that was the, that was the impetus for it. That's what's what drove that. But well, I hated that job with a, with a real passion, in fact. What did you hit about it? Because I guess by all means of measurements of progression, it moved really quickly, which regardless of what we what field that's in, that feels relatively good to some extent in terms of moving up the way. Like there's yeah. an element of feedback to say, Johnny, you're doing really well at this. Here's a promotion. Johnny, you're doing really well at this. We're going to give you more. That feels good, even if it's in a domain that you don't massively care about. And it's an element yeah. of that, that, that I see within like a lot of people's corporate careers when they move up, like it gets harder and harder to leave. The golden handcuffs, people call it, because oh, yeah. financially yeah. it's very hard well, was, to leave. I was doing well financially, yeah. Um, yeah. But what was it you didn't like about the actual day to day? Well, there was two or three things impacted it negatively for me. One comes hand in hand with what you've just described, actually. The growth was so fast uh, that I felt like I knew, I think, I still feel that this is the case, that I was being promoted to these positions based on an interpretation of me as an individual. So for whatever reason, uh, they felt like um, 
like I was a credible individual, somebody, somebody who was able to, to, as I said earlier, articulate well enough and understand situations. And obviously I had a, a sort of experiential background in some of this stuff, so I could talk a certain language uh, in, in terms of how the cases actually themselves manifest. So it wasn't just a kind of a paperwork, a, a, a paper exercise. To interject, Johnny, that's one of the most valuable skills in sales. I've worked across a number of different yeah. industries in sales and being able to speak the language of the Absolutely. people that you're dealing with is vital rather than maybe your internal jargon or internal yeah, slogans. Yeah. Well, and I, and I saw other people fail around me because they were they were very much driven in this kind of tendering approach and they were, they were throwing out data and stats and all the rest of it, whereas I was able to say, well, you know, from the front line, experience that I have, I understand that that's just not going to work or, or you know, you, you, you're not going to bring people in based on these kind of things. People need to know what the job it is they're being offered and, and they need to know what the danger is, all, all that stuff that I could bring to it experientially. But it was so fast I ended up with a kind of a constant uh, uh, imposter syndrome. Like at some point they're going to realize that you haven't got an absolute fucking scooby what you're doing here in terms of sales. That data stuff and I was writing tenders and contracts, no experience in it, no no training in it. Uh, so I would have to really learn fast by reading lots of other contracts. So I ended up pulling, uh, and this was constant, like 120 hour weeks, in order to make sure that that stuff that I didn't have experience on, they just seemed to feel like, ah, you'll be all right for that, you're a clever guy. Uh, so that kind of stuff that didn't come naturally, I was always playing catch up. That takes a lot more time. Um, it took time and it took, it took effort. And I, and I wasn't, I'm not built for it in my head either. I'm not a stats and, and, and data kind of guy. I understand it when I need to, but uh, I don't see things in that kind of black and white uh, 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 mathematical structure. Um, so I found it really, really hard. And going back to the language thing, it was like I was being asked to speak my language and do your thing and all the rest of it while you're at it, you know, chat to this guy. Here's this on Arabic, top. And I'm like, I have no clue how to do this. I'm really having to learn this other language fast. All the while thinking somebody's going to catch me out at some point because now they're paying me six figures i've got a massive car all this stuff all the trappings that come along with it uh and i was just sure it was gonna you know it's all gonna fold and also with it if, if you hark back to what i was saying about the now the um the environment what's the best way to put that the the, the end user if you like was the um were, were children in this foster care system and so what i was doing was Ultimately, the, um, the the most I can't think of any better way to describe capitalism. I'm selling, or I'm trying. I was working for companies who were profiting off the difficulty that these individuals were were experiencing, and there's no other way around that. So you would have these cases. Uh, naturally, the the council, the government, the, the system that we, we we all love should be taking care of that. These kids were, were hard to deal with. So the foster care services that they were receiving weren't able to cope. So they go back into the system. Then another uh, piece is written about how difficult that individual is. And now we have to find specialists. So we were hoarding these specialists and saying, yeah, we can give you the specialists. We've got X amount of specialists for X amount of cases, but it's going to cost you X, Y, Z. Uh, and my job was to make sure that that profit was as big as possible. So we're bringing millions into a company. Uh, and all those millions, in my mind anyway, and I understand that there's nuance to this, but in my mind, all those millions were somehow coming from somebody's pain or, or from a child's pain. And now as a father as well, I find that really difficult to cope with. I even probably, I can, I'm finding it, find it difficult to cope with now. Yeah, to explain the depth of that, because what you are doing is placing a price and a premium of some sort yeah. on our ability to help with this extremely harrowing, difficult situation. Yeah, and yeah. that... And I, I suppose having a, a daughter of your own makes that it made it even hard. harder yeah. when it's already hard enough. And I so, somebody has to do that job. I, like it's very, I get it. I get, yeah. And, and I get that actually th there's an argument at the flip side of that to say, well, you, you're forgetting the fact that these individuals were doing an extraordinary hard job and needed, you know, paid enough to manage that, paid enough to, to et cetera, et cetera. So you could argue that my job was to to ensure that people were being paid the right amount of money to, to offer the, the the special care that and I, it requires a lot. So there's a counter argument to what I'm saying. It's like, you know, lots of mouths to feed in the chain though, and it all yeah. gets a bit uncomfortable think, when you look at the nitty gritty. Well, when you there, there's the crux of it, uh, Cole. When when I was looking at the nitty gritty, I still when I'm tendering for these packages, uh, um, they they give you examples, obviously anonymously, but they give you examples. Um, child X. Uh, and I had to read these files so that I understood how to 
how to position ourselves as the specialists. Are we the specialists with this? And sometimes we'd have to say we don't actually have the people for this, but for the most part we did. So I, was, I had to have to look at these cases and read what was happening to these kids. And harrowing is a great word because you would read it. And if, if you hark back again in this conversation, I have already seen an extraordinary amount of really awful things, you know, things that, that reading this was worse than some of those things I'd seen in, in person, you know. Uh, uh, and I won't, I'll spare your listeners what I'd seen in person, but you know, reading some of this stuff is it, still. I, I could, I could, I could easily end up in tears thinking about it because it was hard. Yeah. So I needed to, and also, sorry, Colin, I know you're about to speak there, but also, 120 hour weeks, traveling up and down the country, being held to a, a sales target, being you know, the whole thing just becomes kind of a constant churn of energy, and and uh, I was I was not living well through it. I was. You know, I've said it mentioned a few times about drinking. I like a drink, but I was drinking medicinally at this point, you know, and uh, really trying to shut things down with booze, which meant I wasn't uh, much use as a husband. Uh, ironically, not much use as a dad, you know, so all these things negatively were impacting me. And it was a kind of a, uh, a moment in amongst it where I was definitely having a breakdown uh, and I didn't see it, but those around me did, you know, so. I'm kicking about with a big beard now, but it wasn't supposed to be on my face at the time. <laughs> I was just a mess. And, uh, uh, and it in, couldn't go on. It couldn't go on and it didn't go on. In the end, um, uh, I, it, well, to, to put a fine point on how cutthroat and mercenary these things were, I'd been through about two or three restructures, moved from company to company because, you know, the nature of that kind of stuff, you know, from your understanding of sales and things is you're, you're almost never as good as your last sale. So it's not like uh, you're ever riding high. You've just got to go again, you know. Uh, the target I, resets the end of every financial year or every quarter. Yeah, it has to it's go. It's extraordinary. Uh, and then, you know, other people not doing their jobs right, it's easy for that to get Teflon this way and that way. So I took responsibility for somebody else's contractual failure that definitely wasn't my fault. Kicked off about it. Ended up in a big argument and ended up in a kind of a tribunal situation. And I just had enough. That was it, done for me. Um, but and this kind of leads us back to the strength and conditioning. There was no, I couldn't see any other next step for myself. Um, uh, barring taking a knee for a bit and then just getting another job doing the same thing. You know, where do I go next? And I knew I would be easily reemployed. You'd be sought after, you've got experience, was, yeah, you can yeah, go and yeah. command a, a, also, a salary. That happens. Yeah, and also the, the uh, being involved in a company that was so successfully winning these contracts, two things were happening. One, I was winning the contracts for them, so I was useful to other companies. Uh, and two, I was also very immersed in what made that happen, you know, so I was able to say, listen, not only I could bring clients with me, I could do this, so I was useful, you know, I could have, could have easily and commanded more money. So, so the, you know, even in those circumstances it could have been an opportunity for me to even earn more but at this point you know I, you could have thrown all the money in the world at me and I, it was going to be of no use to me yeah one of the things that was kind of sitting in the back of my head as you were speaking there is one of my one of my good friends and they've been on the show as well they uh, they they run a business called the physio clinic glasgow yeah. and they speak about people's ability to handle like pain as it builds mm -hmm. and eventually if you've got a coffee cup it just spills over the top. So um, with the kind of training that you and, you and Fergus do and your clients do, eventually the coffee cup will become full with somebody and they they won't be able to systematically handle what's happening. Yeah. That happens emotionally as well. It happens oh, with, the, yeah. you were talking about 120 hour weeks, huge sales targets, people looking to you to lead the way while reading about some of the most potentially upsetting and um, harrowing is the term we'll go back to mm -hmm. um, incidents. There comes a point where the cup is overflowing oh, and yeah. something has to happen off the back of it. Either change time away. Like you said, I could take the knee for a little while and then go into, go into another organization, but eventually that's going to happen again oh, because yeah, yeah, yeah. that is just the nature of that role and the nature of how you were living alongside that role as well. There's going yeah. to be very few people who could potentially do that job and live in any sort of way that they would be happy with over the longer term. I agree. I mean, and people were doing that job and were, were delighted with themselves, you know, uh, and different values, different, uh, different, different, values. Yeah, different, yeah. Uh, different experiences, different life stuff alongside yeah. it. Like yeah. uh, in the same way you were talking about, like when you were writing some of the tenders, you felt like a bit of an imposter, but there'd be things where you would rock up to a meeting and it would feel that you would breeze it. Yeah. yeah. And the sales professionals I've worked with that will say to me, they'll hum and haw for two hours before making a call to a client that they know they need to make this a bit 
scary. Whereas I'll make the call straight away because I kind of know what I'm going to say. Yeah. I'm quite confident about it. So I've used very little mental bandwidth to do that. Whereas they, they've used a lot in the same way that same person might write a tender brilliantly. Whereas I might spend some of the 120 hours that you were speaking about writing that tender and feeling difficult about it. Yeah. And there's got the, horses for courses would be the terminology, yeah, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. And like you say, coming back to the kind of value differences and all the rest of it, it just become clear to me that I, I didn't have any, that this was always an uphill struggle for me. Was, there was never a moment where I'd say, oh, I've done a great job uh, and enjoy that job. Even if I'd done a great job and, and the, like I say, the paychecks came in, I was paid a, a good base, but excellent uh, commission, you know, so you know you're chasing that commission. And, Heavily uh, incentivized to do the deals. Isn't, you're, not, you're not there to just babysit what's there already. You're there to win more. Absolutely, absolutely. And to manage other people to do the same as part of the role. Uh, uh, yeah, so the whole thing was just wrong for me. So um, I stopped. Uh, and, and I had a conversation uh, with my mum, uh, who's gone now, uh, God bless her, but she, her, her response to my describing how I felt about this stuff, I'd lost the job, it had gone, and I, there was no problem in the sense that I wasn't worried about getting another job, but I was essentially unemployed, but was saying for the first time, and I'd probably been feeling this way for years, but said for the first time, I don't want to go back, I don't want to do it. Uh, and I said to her, on a, she was on, on a Zoom call with me, or probably Skype then, I think. And I said, uh, I don't want to do it. Uh, and, 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 and I was upset. I cried. And she was, oh, what are you crying at? And she wasn't, she wasn't one to, to, you know, poo-poo emotion, but she was, you know, hard to. And the fuck are you crying about? <laughs> and I said to her, I feel like I've let everybody down. You know, that uh, I don't want to do this anymore, which means I cannot provide the way I've been providing you know, like I say, we had nice... At least fiscally. Well, this is where it went. So in my mind, I was saying that I've let everybody down. M my wife, uh, I, can't, I can't provide, as you say, fiscally. I can't, you know, I, I can't give what I've been giving if I don't go back to this work. And I can't go back to this work because I'll not survive it, you know. Uh, and, I, and I've let everybody down. And, and she was pissed off with me, really cross with me. And I thought initially because I had let everybody down, you know, but she wasn't. She was... She was really annoyed that it had taken, that, that I didn't understand that, that the value of me to them wasn't in this stuff, you know. So, you know, I'm saying, yeah, but I earn X amount, I've got a nice car, and I've got this, and the next thing I can buy these clothes for, you know. And she was, do you think anybody gives a fuck about this stuff, son? You know, and, and I was quite shocked by that uh, because I thought they did. <laughs> or at least I'd built up this idea in my head that that was important. Um, uh, and she she very clearly pointed out in her very clear manner. Again, she's from Moody's Burn too, so it was it was direct uh, and straight. There was no fluff to that. Um, that the value of me wasn't in that. The value of me for her, she wasn't interested in any of that stuff as long as I was able to be happy uh, and as long as I was able to provide the stability of that kind of happiness to others around me. What use are you to Ashley? If you're a wreck, you look like shit, you know, and, and, and all this kind of stuff she was saying. So she said, what do you want to do? What what do you want to do? If, if we could start afresh and you had any choice, what would you want to do? Well, I just want to coach. Because I was coaching a little bit. Uh, strength and conditioning, nutrition, the stuff I've always wanted to do. This the only stuff that I talk about with any care or passion. Go we'll, we'll fucking do it then. I have no time for this. Call me later. And that was it. You know, which is actually exactly what you needed. And, and it was very loving. I, you know, I'm describing something that sounds like a like a kick up the arse, but that was very much. It's early. coming from the entirely the right place. Yeah. And the message was probably in a tone that you could listen to as well. Oh, yeah. She was telling me that she loved me very dearly. And she was telling me that, that, that she was upset about these things, but wasn't directly. You know, she was just saying, get, get your arse in gear. And, and I came off the phone and, and was quite quite relieved by that you know and it, it felt kind of, kind of like it gave me a kind of a, a real boost and a real power and i told ashley uh, what she said and, and she was almost angry like well yeah obviously i mean what do, what do you want to do and i told her within the space of three weeks we went and you could talk about these six figure car uh, all, all this kind of stuff you have to give it back because a lot of it was just on hawk <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is what the money is, isn't it? You're just kind of in this big, big puddle and then you're like, oh shit, right, I need to give all that back. So all of that went away. This, At least it was things that were not it's all tied into, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it all went away. So, so, and some of it is wrapped up in your identity. You know, I, I was a guy who drove a car like that. I was a guy who, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we still talk about it. We still have a laugh about it. I'll tell you about those cars at some point. They were good. <laughs> but 
that all went away and I went from six figures to four. Uh, because I had been earning well, nobody was going to give me a grant. I wanted to go to university. Uh, uh, I was 32, I think. Uh, and I wanted to go to university. I wanted to to, to actually learn, to, to take what I felt like I knew uh, and, and frame it academically and say, look, right, I do know this, this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I still thought at this point, you know, once I say this is what I want to do, this is what it's going to look like financially, everybody's going to go, oh, well, wait, okay, okay, we said, we said too much. You're going to have to, you know, whatever it was. But everybody was behind it. Uh, and most importantly, my wife uh, was because I was then back to almost, remember I described earlier on those early jobs where I was just a bin man for a day. And so I had to go back to that, you know, running about um, stacking shelves and doing whatever we could just to get that little bit extra money to get us through me traveling up and down to Dundee. And like I say, I didn't get any grants, didn't get any government support for that because on paper I had earned so much over the past X amount of years that no, no, you're, you're good. I'm like, no, but I've got nothing. Yeah, you're good. So I got, <coughs> excuse me. So I had nothing and no, no help on that in that sense. Um, but tremendous backing from the people that matter. Tremendous backing. You. I say no help when, when necessary, uh, uh, my folks would, would, uh, buy me a big bag of coal for the fire and things like that you know and, and you don't want to have that conversation though do you not 32 no exactly exactly so we we scraped by uh and i did uh, four years of a, of a university course uh, uh sport and exercise science and nutrition so it's the, so the, the the academic qualification for me is actually or the or the university route for me is a, is a performance nutrition route uh, and we've gone on with that uh, into a master's and looking at a phd um and then the strength and conditioning side of it, which I was very interested in. If, if you, for the NSCA, the, the National Strength and Conditioning Association, you have to have a university degree to sit their accreditation exam. So you have to have be of a, so once I got that degree, uh, the, the, the nutrition performance degree, I was able to then to sit the accreditation exam, which uh, without huge ego, I, I knew enough to just, I didn't need to read their books. I just passed that. So I went and passed that. So now all of a sudden I was a, a a National Strength and Conditioning Association accredited coach with with a performance um, uh, nutrition background and a hell of a lot of experience. Uh, and all, so all of a sudden I created, well, all of a sudden it took four or five years, but there it was, a, a brand new world. Yeah, amazing. And I find it so interesting when people talk about the conversations they have when they make that big decision. And I've had lots of conversations, I've seen lots of conversations around people leaving the corporate world because they weren't enjoying it and they wanted to work in, in fitness. And that's quite a natural career path because fitness is something that draws us together. Yeah. But yours is just, is one of the stories where I was like, that's actually quite unique in terms of getting to the level of success within the corporate world and the weight that was on top of you to be like, right, okay, I'm going to need to drop away. And of course there's things to rely on. Like I've got friends that are maybe in their mid twenties that leave a graduate job that was paying them whatever it was and making a move to become a PT and pursue something they really care about is an awful lot easier to do at that stage than yeah. it is to do when you've got responsibilities, but also ties to a particular city in terms of all sorts that was happening yeah. at that point as well. So I think there's a, there's well, a the timeline jumps that. about by the time I actually got to university, uh, we'd have to have a tracker here to see where the timelines are and put little marks down for everybody. But we've now got two kids when I, when I started uni uh, and Gabriel, our eldest boy, he was more or less just born. So, Going back to the support I had, uh, I'm also being supported by a, a, a second time mother who's got, Gabriel wasn't easy. So <laughs> she's, what, what she did for me um, is immeasurable. Now I know that, you know, that, that's, that's okay. It's, you know, people will say that kind of thing about their, their wives and all the rest of it. But I, I firmly believe that any opportunity for, for success and growth in the industry that I'm now in was facilitated 100 percent by um initially by those conversations but then by the support uh, of those around me it couldn't have happened without that yeah you know, that would have been impossible because i was actually asking her to kind of take on more essentially in amongst taking on a hell of a lot move with me have kids with me you're not getting any all the money that's gone i'm gonna go away now i'll be away five days a week at uni and the travel to give us up in dundee so it's a good you know 90 minutes each week i had to take a bus because i couldn't afford any else so I wasn't even there, you know. Very, I'm not very say she never complained, but uh, 
if she did it was for the right reason <laughs> yeah she, she, she wrote it out and allowed you to pursue something that Absolutely. was so important Absolutely. to you which is really valuable and importantly your interest in strength conditioning is not just academic if we if we fast forward to to present day you and fergus like to undertake some pretty interesting challenges together one of the first yeah. that i became aware of um when i first got to know fergus was project vertical yeah, yeah. what did that involve so project vertical over the course of 11 days that would be almost two years ago to the day in actual fact that we finished that um feels topical uh, because it was, we, we had focused it to be around uh, Remembrance Sunday, which uh, has just passed. I'm not sure when this will go out, but we're recording it. It's just passed. Um, uh, and also around the the November campaigns. Fergus had had uh, two or three years uh, of focused dedication to those campaigns, uh, and I'd coached him through all those and helped kind of yeah, manage it, those things. I actually trained yesterday at Lyft with Andy, oh, excellent. who introduced yeah. the... He interviewed us, believe, yeah. yeah. yeah that's right, um, it's yeah. a very small world when you start to get... Oh, yeah. yeah. This, like we said earlier on, all these yeah. worlds are small worlds um, if you're in them. But, yeah, that would have been Fergus's one day where he, he ran, squatted, and... Or was it just a squat no, one so you coached the, him the for? First, so, for Fergus, the first uh, uh, focused uh, November campaign was he was to do the most... Squat the most accumulated uh, total weight in 24 hours. So this is 24 hours constantly squatting and how much can we, how much can we ramp up? Uh, there had been a record at the time and he hoped to break it. Um, it and when he had come to me, he had looked at it very much as being a, uh, a squat focused thing. And he was a power lifter and it was like, well, I just need to squat, but I might need a little bit of help at the periphery. Uh, and I had to say to him directly and straight away, this is not a squat challenge. This is an ultra endurance challenge. It just happens to be biomechanically it's a squat, but anything that you're going to have to do over and over for 24 hours is very different to, to, to anything you've done before. Um, uh, and I took him through that journey and, and that brought him into this kind of hybrid world in a certain sense, because now he realized that he needed to have this strong aerobic base and he needed to understand that, that you know, all these different things that he now understands very well, but uh, his introduction to it was, was pretty grim because he, he hadn't a huge timeline. I think we had four or five months to prepare for that. Um, uh, it ultimately, and, and this was just part of the risk of the whole thing. His his knee went about uh, a third of the way into that, I think. And yeah. that's just something that was likely, likely to happen if you're squatting over and over. But um, he was prepared for it physically. Had that not happened, he'd have, he'd have, he'd have done that. Then the second one uh, was was something not dissimilar. Was, was lunging for for the furthest distance anybody had, uh, or certainly that we could find. And as you say, there was another one. Where, a great big year. The year before project vertical where he did the uh, a 94 mile run he there was a few things back to back that he did uh, this kind of big november this i think that's what he called it big november big november or something so i had been coaching all those things and kind of project managing them and and uh, designing the whole focus and all the rest of it and, and fergus had been doing them um and then project vertical uh, again this is fergus's idea he, he's great with numbers and attaching the idea of um uh, the, the the various stats around male suicide. He was able to say, well, there had been ninety four suicides a, a week or a day, etc. We can make that into ninety four miles. So, what he, what he wanted to do with Project Vertical was, over the course of the eleven days during November, from the first through to Remembrance Day, we were we were going to try and uh, continually claim Nevis uh, until such times we had uh, accumulated a vertical marathon and gain. So each each time up there was a just under 1500 meters and we needed 40,000 uh, yeah is that right yeah 40,000 meters of gain uh 40 kilometers essentially of gain yeah. uh and uh and that happened that was horrible <laughs> So we, we trained for that and we did that together. Um, that was you getting involved from an athlete perspective this time around just time a coach. You were very keen to. That's right. We, we, we discussed, there was a bit of me. So, so my background in, in amongst all these other things we're discussing is I had started taking part and spent from early 2010 ish, I think maybe before uh, doing some quite extreme endurance things, but just quiet on the radar. And also the, 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 the hybrid approach that, that we uh, uh, talk about a lot now I had been developing that for years and years because for me, right back to the conditioning stuff with the fight work, it, it made no sense for people to say that you cannot do cardiovascular work alongside uh, uh, heavy strength work because I had seen it work. It had worked personally, but when you were trying to work the two of them together, there needed to be a methodology there or, or, or a way of understanding the process. So I had been developing that for a long time. So I had done things like uh, squatted 
140 kilos for 20 reps and then immediately ran a, a, a 435 mile, uh, none of which was is on social media anyway. <laughs> and I'd done, I think You'd I'd done... You'd have been viral back then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had 175 kilo deadlift for 20 reps and straight into a, a, a one, 124 half marathon. So these things, were there was a blueprint for it there. You know, and he was really good at opening that up and telling people we can do these things. But when Project Vertical came up, it was... I liked the idea. It just seemed right up my street and I'm good at trudging forward and not stopping. Uh, you mentioned pain management earlier on. I have a particular history of managing some, some pretty brutal situations. Um, and also coming back to the core message, this kind of mental health message was that were he to do something like this on his own, it spoke against what we we're actually saying, which was that you need to lean on your friends. You need to communicate with people. You need to say, I am suffering. And turn your head to, to to the man next to you and say, I am suffering and not be afraid of that. So for us to do it together allowed that message to be much more uh, coherent. Uh, it I amplifies think. it. Yeah, it did do. And and the, so the tagline that we used for that uh, was climb your own mountain. So everybody is, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be this crazy thing we're doing. It could be, like you said earlier on, making that call or... Uh, you know, having that conversation, weaving that career, leaving that's that career, you know, destroying you exactly. Whatever it might be that you're not quite facing up to, uh, or that you, you you may be shying away from, you need to lean into that and uh, and exercise that opportunity because there are people around and, and communicating is the way. So, on the mountain, as we're doing this uh, horrid challenge, we 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 had to rely on each other, and, and there was other people around, but we were the only people doing this together. Uh, and eventually, it became something that we could communicate with a nod, you know, but. It, I think it spoke excellently to the message. We felt like that before, uh, that it would speak to that message. It certainly did during... The, the In reality, was, yeah. The feedback was really good. In your uh, your kind of two-year recap for Project Vertical, I read your post about it and you said fear is your friend. Why is that? Yeah. So I, I, in amongst all these things and right back down into the self-protection stuff, uh, I don't think there's anything that, that, has, that I've achieved, including even the corporate thing, where there hasn't been an element of fear. In fact, even right back to the, the dude saying you want to go on the cobbles, you know, and, and I've been advised before that. The idea that most people will, will put forth is that you have to quash that fear and uh, or hide from, or it's not there, you know, I'm not scared, all this kind of bollocks. Uh, and I, I've always been super aware that, that I am scared. Yeah, yeah, this is scary as hell, you know. If you were to say to me now, let's, let's go, you, you, let's fight, I'm going to be scared because I don't know what's going to happen. You know, it's, it's, it's natural. It's good, a natural thing um, from a survival mechanism perspective. Uh, it's a good instinct, but I think people shy away from it a lot. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that, that growth is in that kind of discomfort. Uh, we hear that all the time. You got to, that is where the growth is, isn't it? Is, is, is the growth step, zone, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. You step out your comfort zone, you're going to achieve more things, etc. But for the most part in there is some fear. Um, and if you can lean into that and you can find it, one, you're never going to be able to shut it down. I don't think it should be anybody's hope to do so, but there's so much to be learned in it. Uh, so if you, if you can, this is something Jeff used to say, if you can marinate in that fear uh, and lean into those sharp edges and, and, and find where that scary moment is and harness that, then it, it's powerful. Um, and that, that, that is a theme that has been through everything, is that you know, we're, we're always scared. What are you going to do with it? There's, yeah. a, there's a great book written, I can't remember the author, excellent book, uh, a, a woman, a female psychologist, it's gone, her name's gone, um, Fear the Fear, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Uh, even that, as the name of a book, felt like a great mantra. It's like, yeah, but feeling the fear is the important part. Doing it anyway is, 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 that comes after, but you've got to feel the fear. How do you think people can feel the fear more often and do it regardless? Identify those fears. So everybody's scared of lots of things. Um, and Again, to, to lean heavily into, into, into Jeff's writings, the, uh, you, you could, um, he had something called a fear pyramid that he, he liked people to investigate the idea of like, okay, what's your sort of foundational day-to-day -day fear? And it could be something like spiders. Okay, so why don't you deal with that fear first? Deal with something that might be, or, or making a call. Like maybe your salesman, as you said earlier on, who, who wastes a lot of time uh, uh, procrastinating about that phone call because they're scared of the outcome. Um, you kind of lean into that fear first because ultimately that's something you could probably overcome with a little bit of practice. So think about the spiders. Okay, first thing you want to do is just look at one. Some sort of exposure to it. Exposure, yes. But you expose yourself to a small, something small. And then in that 
in that exposure, learning, okay, nothing terrible happened. I understood that. I'm still afraid of spiders, but now I know I can touch them. Now I know yeah. I can let this tarantula crawl on me after having gone through this process, whatever it was. Um, maybe I'll move up the pyramid and I'll go to the next fear. You know, and so if you can identify what those fears are, what am I day to day things I, I can easily avoid i can easily move around that that doesn't matter uh, and what are the larger things that are actually holding me back in life um or, or what are the things that, that kind of cast a huge shadow over me all the time that makes me you know feel all that kind of what people would describe as negative emotion identify those things and then let's start challenging them head on you know for me uh actually for most people um these things are uncomfortable, even 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 doing this kind of because you know, we're, we're slightly in a false environment. Public with, speaking as public well. Public speaking's huge. Mm -hmm. That's where I was going with it. Is that and public speaking taps into a, a very primal fear. I mean, when you think about public speaking, <coughs> excuse me. What you're doing is you're imagining yourself moving along with the herd in in, in, in a tribe, and what uh, in public speaking you're almost literally standing up on a rock, identifying yourself as being separate from the tribe, and exposing yourself. <clears throat> emotionally and, and uh, your primal brain knows well now the fucking saber-toothed tiger can see me and only me you know so you're, you're actually in those situations public speaking it's akin to the fear of death you know your whole system's just going don't do this and if you've done public speaking no matter how many times you do it that moment before you go out there your whole system almost shuts down you know and the only way to kind of get better at that is to expose yourself maybe on a smaller level maybe speak to the family maybe a small group of friends can you listen to this thing etc cetera, etc cetera. and then people get good at it with their job you sharpen Even, the tools sharpen and the tools, and yeah. you have relative competence which gives you confidence in the yeah. longer term yeah but you've got to expose yourself to it over and over you move yourself away from that and say i remember doing public speaking 10 minutes 10 years ago you're going to suddenly shit yourself you know it's got to be you know uh, <coughs> a in constant, recent memory that you've sharpened and worked on yeah, yeah. graded yeah. exposure and and, and and there so yeah that's that's a natural one for people um fear of confrontation might be another one which means people again that the phone call you mentioned earlier on but it could be anything it could be uh not getting the promotions that you probably deserve because you're afraid to go and speak to the boss and say i deserve that promotion um something maybe in in my industry now where there's um where we might have bigger projects we need and want brands to get involved it might be a fear of just approaching that brand and saying listen i am worth x y and z here's here's why i think so because you might think you'll tell me to do one rejection's a terrible fear rejection. for many people yeah. like whether it's um business deals whether it's relationships whether it could be it could be anything just reaching yeah. out and kind of being that vulnerable position where somebody says no to you it feels like the, the weight of the world's just yeah. dropped on you and it could be going back to that kind of uh, climb your own mountain thing it could be just a case of a conversation with a girlfriend or a boyfriend that, that you you feel like you want it, it might, might be positive it might be stop leaving your fucking underwear everywhere or it might be you know you might want to marry them or something and you just you know, i'm not sure i don't know what it's, you got to feel that fear you got to know what it's about you're going to know why you feel that fear and then you're going to have to do it but in doing it and then overcoming even that small fear right up to the big one uh, there's so much power there because as soon as and you again any listeners yourself and anybody involved in this kind of stuff will know that if they've conquered something like that then the feeling on the other side is powerful it's huge uh, and, and you will feel even momentarily like you can conquer anything i can take on the world here because i did this thing you know now that that'll wear off pretty quick like any kind of dopamine hit would but you're still left with lessons there and those lessons are well what what did i do and it wasn't i presented and spoke it was actually the, the lesson is i felt that fear i felt the the butterflies i felt the uh, and, and there's a going back to my past i could be in a situation where i used to work the doors so i could be in a situation on the doors where i'm being challenged really you know it's, they're telling me they're going to do some horrendous things to me and all the rest of it it's no good for me to break down and go, oh God, you know, I've got to, I've got to look like it does not phase me at all, you know, but you, you, your whole, your tummy's going like mad and you want to shit yourself. Every, every part of you is saying, run the other direction. This guy wants to kill you. Uh, so you have to see that, stand in that, immerse yourself in it a little bit, understand those feelings are natural, let them come, let them speak to you. They're sharpening you. They're getting you ready. Uh, and then on the other side, it would be you, you survived that situation. Yeah, well. I had a sports psychologist called Hannah Huseman on the podcast and she coaches the Texas Rangers mm -hmm. and she said, reframe nervous to excited Yeah, and fear is very similar. Yeah. Just change the terminology you use around it if it makes you feel better. Like if somebody's confronting you physically, change those nervous fear feelings into yeah. my body is reading me 
to ready, take on this one. challenge yeah, and yeah. it's giving me the required energy or stimulus or little bit of boost to be able to deal with yeah, what potentially yeah. is coming. So even then, no, you're, you're entirely right. Uh, the, the natural, uh, 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 what's the word, the sort of cacophony of, of hormones and, and this hormonal response, even right down to the kind of a narrowing of your, of your, of your vision and all the rest of it, this tunnel vision that you'll get in those situations, which is scary for people like, shit, I can't even see properly. Your system's saying, go, it's saying, do this thing. Now you get this kind of fight, flight, or even freeze response. And there's lots of different reasons that might happen, but training that and understanding it, if, if you allow it to happen, then you're probably not going to know what you're going to do with that whole thing. You're just going to get this flood of emotion, this flood of physicality, this flood of uh, physical responses. And then what you, what are you going to do? No idea. Cause you've never been there before or cause you hid away from it and all the rest of it. Whereas if you can expose yourself to fear, more often than you train yourself to feel exactly what uh, the psychologist was describing, feeling that kind of horrible, nervous energy, which feels negative and saying to yourself, well, okay, why am I feeling this? Well, I'm feeling this because I'm ready. I'm feeling this because my system is saying it's go time. I'm feeling this because now actually the adrenaline's flowing so hard. I'm powerful. I can go as long as I can harness this, then I'm ready. You know, all this kind of stuff. So it could be sport related. I'm sure you would feel it on the, on the, uh, you know, the, the, the starting blocks before a race and all the rest of it. And you, if you, if you give yourself over and your legs start shaking, you're not going to perform well. You've got, you've got to relax into that. So channel it, channel it. Exactly. So there are so many applications for it. Uh, but I think that, that, that there's different ways of describing it. There's different, uh, uh, physical mechanisms to look at. There's different physiological mechanisms, different psychological mechanisms, and all of them speak to a certain part of it, I think. Uh, but at the core of it is, is fear. And, and, uh, you know, there's probably many people call that many different things, uh, uh, but it's, it's fear nonetheless. So I think exposing yourself to fear in lots and lots of different ways is going to expose yourself to that feeling, which is going to ultimately allow you to be more productive, uh, and open so many more doors for you. Uh, I think there's a huge benefit to doing that. What's yeah. one fear that you're leaning into still, Johnny? Uh, I'm doing it now, mate. Uh, the, the, I find these things kind of uncomfortable. Um, and, and I talked about the kind of the brand involvement and things. And, and actually, even uh, I'm very lucky that the brands I'm involved with are um, uh, friends of mine, you know, and, and we've developed a relationship in that sense. But when we have to talk about the financial side of things, you know, I almost want to go, oh, fuck it, just, just do whatever, do whatever. And that's no good. That's not me looking after me. It's not even looking after them. So. I'm almost afraid of that. Like kind negotiating of the, the fees yeah, for yeah, that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I find it very sort of distasteful and uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, there's things like that. There's uh, uh, there's oh, everybody has life stuff going on where you kind of want to shrink away from it. There's growing the business. Uh, Fergus and I are, are, are constantly trying to find ways, not just from a financial perspective to grow the business, but some opportunities to kind of, uh, from the very start, I've always seen this as a, 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 as a real, opportunity for me to help kind of facilitate joy so if somebody can from what i'm imparting to them educationally or even in the moment if we're training together or whatever can come away from that saying yeah i get it and that adds something positive to them that's where i get the real buzz from that's that's exciting for me um so we're trying to find the ways to grow the business for that to happen quite often that means a step in, into something you don't know or maybe shutting down one way of working and starting a completely new way of working which you think Shit, is this even going to work we've done that a few times so it's always there. It's always there. But before those moments, I still have that kind of right will. And even seminars, we still do seminars now and again. And I still have that public speaking thing where I just think I'm standing at the door and I think, I can't believe I need the sixth piss in the last 15 minutes. And I might just bolt. <laughs> and you think that, and then you don't. You but know, you lean into it, you do it. You lean into it. And it. over time, when you get up to perform, you're happy to do it because you've done it many, many times before. It's just that feeling of, goodness me to have to do this right before it exactly and then i've got bigger things coming up um where i think that uh i'll i'll have to lean into this kind of thought process hard um over the next over 2023 i'm going to try and it, within the one year which is what's going to make it tough from a recovery and turnaround process i'm going to try and do an extreme ultra marathon across the arctic circle then one across the desert then one through the jungle uh, and then uh, one over some remote mountain ranges in uh, Tian Shan, so it's uh, Gurkistan. Um, that's horrible. <laughs> it's going to be horrible. So uh, there'll be lots of moments to kind of lean into that. So that becomes a very kind of personal uh, challenge where 
uh, Fergus and I have talked about this a lot, and I always refer to this kind of line where I'm saying that you meet yourself. So in amongst these things, not dissimilarly to fighting, in amongst these things at some point, I'm going to meet like a little sort of shadow version of myself who's going to say, fuck it off, just bin it. Nobody expects you to finish this anyway. The fact that you're here is enough. And all these kind of negative talk, which is this um, justification or rationale to, which is probably there, you know, ultimately you, you don't make it through something like that. Nobody knows, you know, nobody knows if you tried or if you gave up. Um, so you're going to meet that kind of very That happens reasonable. on a micro level every single day. Every but single day, yeah. yeah. In terms of when you undertake a challenge like that, it's happening all the time. Yeah, and, and there are some real dark moments uh, uh, where you feel like you cannot continue. Nevis was a good example of that. There were some real horrible moments where, where there was pain and, and, and things that I didn't think I could get through. And, and you have to kind of, again, lean into that and say, well, th there are practical considerations to be made there. Am I going to hurt myself permanently? If so, fuck it off. It's not worth it. But for the most part, you can probably continue, but you can talk yourself out of it very easily. So in amongst those moments of this opportunity to kind of meet this negative drivers that you have and say, okay, I see that, you know, but I'm going to kind of dissolve that with, 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 with powerful thinking and I'm going to keep marching on. And I'm expecting very much to meet that, that Johnny Payne many times on these adventures and, and face him down and win. That's the hope. Um, and that's the challenge. And that's kind of, that, that's the excitement of it is that, you very rarely get the opportunity to meet to, to do that kind of thing on on such a level so that's that, i'm scared of that now <laughs> well I'm, I'm excited to see it all happen johnny i'm sure the listeners are as well where's the best place for them to continue the conversation with you uh instagram is where uh probably more um present at the moment uh and that's just at johnny Payne. or is it no it's at jonathan Payne. It'll be linked in the show notes, so yeah, we can yeah. we can think, we can find Jonathan it. No problem. Payne, but, but, the, but the handle is Johnny Payne. But you can find and the YouTube's coming as well. Yeah, we got YouTube that is at Johnny Payne. Um, it's, it's just on a holding pattern at the moment. We're going to try and make some stuff off the back of this project and really kind of tell people a bit of a story of where we're going with it and, and, and how we've done that. And then there's there's Omni Performance. That's the the company that Fergus and I run together. Again, at Omni Performance uh, on Instagram, and you can have a look at the site there and find out a little bit more about what we both do and why we do it. Amazing, Johnny. Thank you very much. And thank you to you, the listener. I'll be back to speak to you all again thank very, you. very soon.